Awesome. Well, hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jessica Mesa Torres. I'm with Literary Arts. Thank you all for being here tonight. We're so excited to be a part of this Sagittarius group chat about Elisa Washuda's new book, White Magic. Um, I know we have folks joining us from all over, but before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that Literary Arts is based in Portland, Oregon, and that we are currently on unceded land. The Monoma, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, Walala Bands, the Tuala Tenkalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River occupied and operated on this land long before Western colonizers arrived, and many continue to do so today. Despite attempts of removal and erasure, these communities remain a strong and vital part of our future. Literary Arts recognizes that this acknowledgement is only a small step in affirming the ongoing presence and contributions of our Native communities, and we commit to engaging these communities more fully as we fulfill our mission. For those of you who are not familiar with Literary Arts, our mission is to engage readers, support writers, and inspire the next generation with great literature. Our programs include Portland Arts and Lectures, Programs for Youth, the Oregon Book Awards and Fellowships Program, and the Portland Book Festival. We also offer reader seminars, writing classes, and free literary events like this one year round. And although we can't physically meet, you can still find many ways to stay involved over at literary-arts.org. All right, um, now I'm gonna introduce, are you ready for your grant entrance? I hope so. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> Alyssa Washuda is a member of the Cowlitz Indian tribe and a writer of personal essays and memoir. She is the author of two books, Starvation Mode and My Body is a Book of Rules, named a finalist for the Washington State Book Award. Her work has appeared in Salon, The Chronicle of Higher Education, BuzzFeed, and elsewhere. An advisor for the Department of American Indian Studies at the University of Washington and a nonfiction faculty member in the MFA program at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Alyssa lives near Seattle. Hello. Hello, it's good to see you all. Um, hi, thanks for being here. Um, you actually have an old bio. I'm in Ohio now here and you can tell it's Ohio um, where I work at the Ohio State University. So I'm up, I'm in the East Coast time. I'm up past my bedtime. Not really, I don't sleep, I have insomnia. Um, and really just super excited for my um, West Coast book launch, I think. Um, super happy to be here with my group chat and, um, and happy to be sort of virtually in Portland where my ancestors basically roughly in the area came out of the came out of the egg of a Thunderbird 10,000 years ago. Um, so I'm gonna read for a little bit. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot of overlap between the guest list tonight and the guest list a couple days ago, which is good because I'm gonna reread something um, that is dedicated to the Sagittarius group chat. Um, this is an essay called My Heartbreak Workbook. It begins with an epigraph from Harville Hendricks, PhD, from the book, Keeping the Love You Find, A Personal Guide. Understanding the nature of your wound is the key to your healing, for it has affected all of your behavior, your decisions, and your life choices, especially in the arena of intimate relationships. It is the healing of our wounds that we seek consciously or not in committed relationships. The internet says nobody will love me until I learn to love myself, but the internet never gives instructions. I told myself, I love you, but I was thinking, you're the worst. Nothing would change my mind. What a terrible impasse. The bookstore self-help section though said something different. Nobody will love me until I engage in sequential self-exploration exercises. Harville Hendricks's self-help book for wounded singles says there is a riddle wrapped around my heart. I have a highlighter, a composition book, and a pen. I have time. I do not have any better ideas. The self-help book says the brain turns all that has happened to us into points. From the points, it makes patterns. 
the book says the collected memories are like pixels in a digital image we store of the only person we believe can close the wound. The last few years have been like this. A cord of twined images of white boys with plastic glasses and plaid shirts and bad posture and two thirds full pints on outdoor bar tables. My finger presses into a flattened mouth to pull it left or right. I could build a man in my sleep. Look, whiskey and IPAs. Snowboarding is my life. Been single for a while now due to avoidance of drama, but I'm ready to put myself back out there for the right girl. Nice guy, not a serial killer. LOL, looking for my partner in crime. Bourbon and scotch. The kid is my niece. Just moved back to the Northwest, taking applications for a travel companion. Enjoy a healthy and active lifestyle. I have near perfect straight teeth for never having braces and have no clue why I don't smile with my teeth. Craft beer enthusiast, not here for hookups. Podcasts, adventures, movies, guitars, hiking, whiskey, dogs, Star Wars, sushi, snack plates, coffee, wine, motorcycles, dancing, drinks, travel, positive vibes, minimalism, bacon, passion, looking for a discreet lover, must be fit and in shape. I want us to be like an old Nintendo console, blow on it hard and shove it back in the slot. This is nonfiction. I took this from Tinder bios. Um, School of Hard Knocks, University of Life, six foot one if it matters. Polly dude with a big heart. I want to beat you at pool. Caring, compassionate, level-headed, drama-free, honest, loyal, humble, passionate, easygoing, funny, adventure-seeking, and so on. Looking for a wife to start a family colony. 420 friendly. I love the outdoors. I am that serial killer you have been looking for, LOL, JK. I enjoy meeting people and going out and trying new things. I like to be active, but also enjoy staying in. Follow your passion, be prepared to work hard and sacrifice, and above all, don't let anyone limit your dreams. Must love dogs, be low maintenance, and love hiking. Living every day like it's my last. I like beautiful smiles. I'm a good guy. Good job, not an asshole. I love exotic women and different cultures. What's your fantasy? Growing old, but never up. Dream big, work hard, die living. It's like a game. Each match is dopamine rich as a sunk ski ball. Congratulations, you have a new match. The self-help book says that when I read it, I'm like a mystery solver. The hurts I can't get out of my head are clues. People, places, dates, and times, I fill my dossier. Somewhere in the sheaf between my troubles and attempts to fix them, I will find myself. When I was 14, riding the bus home from school, a boy asked me if he could cope, cut open my chest, pry apart my rib cage with his hands, and rip out my heart. Sure, I said, so he'd like me. He looked so much like my celebrity crush that he could have been his doppelganger. His name was Salvador, and he was one in a long line of the boys and men I called upon to save me. Not the first or the last, not the worst, not the source, just another crush. He said he was going to wait to open my rib cage. He said it's much easier to pry apart a rib cage than you'd think. I started thinking of him as the incubus, something I found on the internet. At night, I kept my bedroom window open and hoped he wouldn't come in with the spring air, boy turned demon, broad shoulders as vessels for the unfurling of wings. I stood at the door to the woodshop classroom and watched his hands. If he had opened my chest, he would have found the hole, bigger than a heart and a stomach. I thought it was an organ, maybe the soul I had learned about in Catholic school and imagined as a limp gray sack. The hole had always been there. And when I was little, I filled it with Cadbury cream eggs. In high school, I used it as a hiding place for the NyQuil I drank from the Gatorade bottle in my locker. Later, I would keep all sorts of things in the hole. Whiskey, Vicodin, cheese, a butterfly knife, Nintendo games, teeth, boxed wine, antipsychotics, condoms. 
Salvador was expelled for knocking over a soda machine and threatening to kill us all. The self-help book says we face a paradox. Relationships inflame the wound, but it's only through relationships that will heal it. It is not the relationship that fixes us, but the reclamation process we enact through it. We are carrying the picture of the person who can take us through the final movement in our failing search for wholeness. We keep falling for them, but as long as we face them with imperfect courage, quote, we are in a waking sleep, fated to repeat the same mistakes over and over. Tinder's founders liked the idea of the spark that starts the fire. My phone is a portal to an other world of strangers stretched out next to zoo tigers or scaling mountains I'll never visit. The book says I'm looking for someone whose fingers fit into my wounds. The author thinks this is a good thing, a way to heal, but I won't know which wound opener I need by the species of fish he shows the camera. We have to meet. The author tries to coax me toward the site of my original wounding, but I won't go. A scene repeats in an infinite memory loop. In a bar with sticker caked walls, a man sits down. He looks just like his pictures. I know he can see the hole. I try to fill it with whatever he wants to see. I can see his teeth when he speaks. He drinks whiskey. I drink soda. I look at his hands and imagine them inside my chest. I swear he's looking at me like he's going to be the one who saves me. The self-help book says our reality is a fabrication of our own making formed from our thoughts and actions. And yet the book says thinking alone is no fix. Changing our beliefs isn't as easy as wanting them changed. We'll only let go when we can no longer stand the pain. The day after Carl broke up with me, I saw a psychic in a blinds down building between the Cash America Pond and the discount gas station. She brought her brow toward mine and froze me. You were a man in a past life and you were a womanizer. That is why you're being punished. That is why they use you. I nodded. You are five years behind where you should be in love, she said. Did you know that? I nodded. You are empty inside, she said. Did you know that? I nodded. At a meditation-based sobriety meeting, a woman talks about the whole. I didn't know she could see it, but it turns out she has one too. She tells me she saw the hole once she stopped drinking. The only thing that can fill the hole, she says, is God. I don't even know what that means. When I think of God, I think of Catholic grade school and the laminated cards of Jesus opening his robe to show his cloth draped chest, burning with a heart on fire, ringed with a thorn rope, staked down the middle with a cross. I imagine the hole like a yellow plastic ring full of iridescent bubble solution catching light. I try to keep God in the hole, but God is a bag of sand and the hole gets empty before it can get half full. I fill the hole with crystals, candle wax, handwritten affirmations, auspiciously shaped stones, tarot cards, spent matches, shells, photos of ancestors, herbs, astrological charts, shiny pennies, essential oils. I wedge a cauldron into the hole. The woman at the meeting says, we all have a hole inside us and we're supposed to show it to others. Mary, like her son, showed her heart, radiating light, encircled by roses, lanced with a knife. Every night I draw the same tarot card, three of swords, a trio of blades through a red heart. I touch my hands to my skull and ribs. I try to find the hole so I can show it to anyone who will look, but my hands grow hotter and hotter against my skin as they search. The current rips down my spine and I feel it. Not a hole, but a channel, a tube filling with light. In my mind, I line up all the holes I've ever reached into, holes cut into everyone I've ever tried to love, and I just look at them. The self-help book asks itself what happens to the parts of ourselves we deny. The book answers right away. 
this self disappears underground. We recognize it in the partners we try to love. It looks like a fight. To make a paper fortune teller, you have to cut a piece of loose leaf into a square. Fold, 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 unfold, fold, unfold, put your fingers inside, push out, write your desires and fears all over it. That is how I love. I give a soft boy the pen and tell him to write about his hole and how he thinks he can fill it. A paper fortune teller gets old fast. You have to move on, play mash, divine whom you're going to marry and how cool your house will be and how many babies you'll have. You have to keep playing until you get your perfect life. Some people don't identify abandonment as their deepest fear. I don't understand. When I sit down at a small bar table and take in a date, before he even speaks, I can tell how deeply he could wound me. When he stays, when he leaves. This, the book says, is chemistry. Knowing he'll disappear and I'll cling because pulling away would let his fish hooks tear my flesh. To survive, I fold myself into the small thing he couldn't object to. I am the infant relying on her baby cuteness to evoke an adult's caretaking impulse. I curl my spine forward around my heart, steering conversations away from my accomplishments, asking, but how about you? How are things going for you? The thing a soft boy does must be survival too. As soon as I find his hole and insert all of me, he stops speaking, starts drinking, never leaves his phone face up on the coffee table while my mouth latches onto his mouth and my eyes try to read his mind, but his eyes shift to the side before his lids close me out. Can I really say his way of tending the fear is worse? Is hurting the one you love a worse offense than gouging out your own soul so you can stuff your brittle husk full of whatever you think he wants to find when he delves inside you? In my notebook made workbook, jumbled memories refuse to connect like dots. The self-help book says the remembering of childhood hurts will get us to ourselves, but I get to a mess of ill-fitting labels. Childhood didn't wound me and my parents didn't fail. They made a house where I could hide out. The site of my wounding can't be reached because it disappeared under the damned river's water clot long before I was born into the nightmare. I took it in before a breath. The self-help book says we seek relationships that recreate the theft of our joy. If I never find what was lost, what then? The self-help book says, the self-help book knows we don't like the work of healing. We'd prefer an easier way. The book promise us, promises us that its worksheets are less painful than other people are. There is a self that just wants to find its way back to us. It fears death and wants to live. Tell me where to go and I will, I hear it asking me, but from where? I calcify into my mattress's divot. I believe the pain really will kill me. The whole offers to hold the pain. This, it tells me, is what it lives for. I keep pulling the death card, a skeleton on a white horse, armor clad like a conquistador, stepping over fallen and swooning bodies, headed for sunrise. Death, sudden change, the old self's death, transformation, loss, failure, debacle, disaster, ruin, and beginning. The only way out is through the land of the dead, opposite land. The author says I must break patterns. So I take up my fencing weapon, open my third eye, cast releasing spells, summon friends with my mind while walking around the city, dress like the Virgin Mary in vintage robes, speak with the dead, pray over candles, get a second opinion from a psychic who tells me, he is weak, Alyssa, and you are strong with the power in your blood. I heal myself with my own hands. I have no other choice. I was gaping in that bed. I could fill the hole only with work and energy. And even full, the hole remains. But now with him dislodged, I can see it isn't a void. It's a portal through which things can enter to make me strong. The self-help book says, you will know you are almost to the gates of paradise when you feel like you are falling into the pits of hell. The structure of your entire self shifts and falls to pieces. 
love turns to chaos. The paradise ahead goes dark and you can try to push on toward it, but its gates are locked. The book has a promise. In this wreck, your lost self can find you. I'm told to list the qualities of my ideal partner. No. First, I have something I need to say. Fuck boys, you are not special. This is worse for me than it is for you because I'm the one stuck in a gif in which I sit at a bar and smile while you tell me about this one time you were drinking with your buddies and this one thing happened. I want you. I want to listen to your collarbones and lick the skin over your ribs and slide my fingers along your iliac crests. But I don't need you the way the women of my great great grandmother's generation needed the men who slid in and out of their lives after the whites hustled the Cascade people onto reservations, hanged their leaders, and upended the ways of living that had been shaped over 10,000 years. 150 years ago, the women in my maternal line learned to complete themselves because white men had broken the world in which men and women fed each other what they needed to become whole. Soft boys of Tinder. Hear me. I have my own car, my own cash, my own large exotic zoo animals with which to recline. I cook my own meals, catch my own fish, write my own inspirational quotes. I am the substance I use to intoxicate myself, moving my bones for the mirror, over and over making and unmaking a cup of my collarbone and trapezius. I come from women whose dresses drip with the dentalium shells that were pulled from deep water and used like cash. I come from high status women with cradleboard flattened heads, from women with their own canoes, their own land and the place where they lived for 10,000 years. Men of my history, hear me. When you talk down to me, fuck around on me, disappear from me, lie to me, that's an interesting perspective, but actually me. You disrespect a woman made of women knotted in a long string stretching back before massacre. The egg that would become my mother was in my grandmother's ovary when her mother severed the cord. The first of us came from eggs the Thunderbird laid near the mouth of the river. I have my own blade, my own wings, my own lanced heart that might never heal but will never need your salve. I do not want you badly enough to let you grip the rim of the hole, climb in and leave it full of emojis and come. The hole is perfect and you cannot touch it. I delete the app. The end. <laughs> Turn your mics on, let's talk. Hooray! Yay, Alyssa! <laughs> Loved it. You like it? You like my book? Yeah. I love your book. <laughs> I love your book. Halfway through your book, I was like, oh. Maybe I should just redo my essay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so, it's very refreshing. Thank you for that. You're Thank so you for listening. funny. You're so funny. Like, you're just like, you're so like, ah, uh, like you have this way of like being like inside of a sentence that I wish I could sit inside of a sentence all the time where it's like it's funny but then immediately you can turn it into something where it's like oh shit we're going to be very serious right now but then swoop up again into something funny which I think is such a fucking talent it's so impressive to me thank you I think I learned that from Twitter because you have to do a lot in a very small space <laughs> I don't even remember how many characters we have anymore it's it's probably still too many. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Really? I, I'm looking at a, a year of having deleted Twitter coming in May. What am I missing? Am I missing anything? I oh, tagged you the other day, even though you're not there. Oh, you missed my scandal. You missed my scandal altogether. <laughs> did, did, does everybody, did everyone get scandals or just Morgan? Just, was just Morgan. Just Morgan. <laughs> I'm doing great. <laughs> oh. I'm doing fantastic over here. Um, <laughs> I mean, Twitter. It's a bad place. It's, it's bad, a... but I, I really like it. And I know, me too. That was really the worst thing about the scandal is I then felt like I couldn't tweet dumb shit. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You can't tweet a public apology and then like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what's going on with the housewives. Like, I don't even do, do that. Please do it. Oh my God. 
my god. So I feel like, yeah, a, a lot of fun has been taken from Twitter. But yeah, the scrunching things up into like a little quip. I love it. Love it. You're great at it. And uh, thank you for being on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, well, Alyssa. You know, I'm thinking of deleting it. I just stay. <laughs> It can't just be me, you guys. <laughs> I'm on there. I know. I like, will not leave. Saying the dumb shit. Like, is it just gonna be me being like, "Here's what a stupid ravioli is"? No. <laughs> it cannot be just me. <laughs> just stay there. I can't. I. I feel. I find myself going on Instagram way less. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I love the little quips. I don't need. I mean, it's a lot of pictures and moving things, and you know. <laughs> Also, but, you know, the thing that's a bummer, I hate the apps that aren't interested in archiving. <laughs> like, the fact that, like, you can get tagged in stuff. Like, you guys have tagged me in stuff that I never saw. Because then if I don't go on for 24 hours or however long, it's, like, disappeared. Can you see? Can you change that? <laughs> you're like, you're like, what did they say about me? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I think there's, like, millions of pictures from my tour that, like, Cause I'll go on like days later and it's like all these people mentioned you, tagged you in a photo. So can you change that? Or is everyone just no, going no, on? No, that's the nature day? of Instagram. You yeah. embrace in permanent. Every day, it's like the apps. Yeah, this, if they don't post you to Maine, if you're only on the stories, it's there for 24 hours. But Alyssa, that's I'm cute. Say, that's bullshit. What, 24 hours? <laughs> it's some people are into the ephemeral nature. I rarely, I don't do <laughs> almost anything every 24 hours like that's crazy <laughs> nothing that doesn't have to do with like maintaining this vessel like <laughs> that's crazy oh Alyssa, my God. do you have your own tinder bio anywhere um do you remember what it said <laughs> for the longest time it said i'm a psychic witch and i hate america <laughs> 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 Before I got into my relationship, I was on Tinder with Alyssa one time. Right. This, and I was like scrolling through my Tinder bio. It was like, I think it said something like, I'm gay and I'll steal your dog. <laughs> Wait, what? Well, that, that veterinarian? Though. That would have been such a. Like... I, yeah, I remember we were at the <laughs> bar waiting for food and I was like, oh, yes, finally, the Holy Grail, like a lesbian <laughs> veterinarian. <laughs> Mine said, like, and mm, there was like a lot of weird connections that were highly specific uh it was like burning the cross between bernie max saying america and Allen ginsburg saying america and like a cross between like angela davis and angela bassett it was like a lot um but the account got deleted due to inactivity <laughs> i didn't even know that could happen i don't think that's like even a thing i think they just did that for me because <laughs> <getting pathetic. laughs> like, so i don't remember now you know the rest of the stuff but uh i, I definitely know it said don't be racist <laughs> like that's that was it tommy i think mine like said like i'm oh, sorry go ahead oh i was gonna say like I think mine was like, I blah, blah, you know, be gay, do crimes. And once I learned how to read, it's over for you, host. <laughs> <laughs> and yet you're on a banner. You're on a poetry banner, aren't you? Are you still on a poetry banner? I am. Uh, oh, yeah, on, I haven't seen it. On Santa Monica in Edinburgh, um, right outside of Employees Only in Los Angeles. Uh, you can see my face uh, and a quote like from that. a poem. You um, know what, Tommy? Remember they made a flag for me, but they never put it up. I'm glad they did you instead. Cause I would have been mad if it was like, you know, not you. <laughs> like, <laughs> I wonder what, I wonder if they actually, cause it was supposed to be uh, last year, I guess. And they- You know, I bet it. they put it up. The thing is they were, they had, they made it sound. They were just going to be like banners all over West Hollywood. <laughs> and it's just yeah. this one thin thing on a street that you can't even see because of a tree right in front of it. What? <laughs> oh, <that sucks. laughs> I want, I just, am like, it's cool that you, you know, didn't do the whole thing. Uh, Tommy is a better photograph usually but if they printed it i want it in my house <laughs> that's the other thing i'm like what are you going to do with it now yeah. however 
I mean, not like I'm bringing home people at all. Not that I, I mean, the pandemic was a convenient excuse not to do it, but like, <laughs> not that I'm going to do it anyway, because I'm not interested in having another person in my house. But if I were to theoretically. There's too many would, plants now, Tommy. You can't. Sure. I know, where are you put it? <laughs> No, I got Morgan into plants, or Morgan got into plants, but Morgan's into plants now. Nobody, Wait, I, put the, I put the polka dot plant here for you. You've been it asking all about be it. Dead. Oh, I love it. Is it pink again, or is it still green? See if I can get it down here. See if it wants to come. <laughs> yeah, it's doing great. Ooh, yeah. Look. Ooh. Pink. I love it. Mine is just dead. It's like, it's very tall. It got very long legs. It's like very tall with like a thin bloom on top. And it, I'm just like, die. You're ugly. Just cut it back. Just. You love a tall man, Tommy. I know. It's <laughs> true. <laughs> Lean and, you know, difficult. <laughs> I saw, no, Alyssa, can you pull that back up one more time? Did I see a fly trap in there? Are you still dealing with gnats? Um, there was one gnat a few days ago and I was being like video recorded for something. I don't remember what, and I really desperately wanted to grab the gnat and I finally just went for it and I got it. <laughs> yeah. This is my life. My students have seen me, you know, collect all the gnats, um, it's not quite gnat season yet here, but yeah, the plants are doing well. They're very relieved that it's um, humid out again. Ooh. Matilda, yes, it is two different plants. I don't know what this one is, but this one is the same as this back here. I think it's supposed to be outdoors, but it's happy here. Francis, the mosquito dunks don't, nothing works. It's Ohio. Nothing, nothing is truly killing them. I, it's a hopeless case. That sounds how when I talk about Florida, I'm like, no, that doesn't work. So yeah. how is Miami? You're in Miami now. Oh God. I mean, I mean, I, I finally, we were talking about this before. I finally got my second shot not that long ago. Thank God. Yeah. Um, but we still haven't like, I was like, we've lived here for like a little bit. And I was like, we haven't done anything here yet. I'm like, I don't know what anything is here. I don't know what anything is going on. All the plant life is different. All the animals are different. Yeah. Just a new tropical atmosphere. Doesn't matter that I've lived in Florida my whole life. I'm ill-equipped. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're more equipped than anyone else I know. So there's that. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind. You yeah. Know? I don't fucking know. It's like it's nice to be able to be outside again. It's fun to talk to. I, I just am like leaning into dad mode. I mean, I love that anyway, but I just like, cause now like Kayla's here with me. And so she hasn't lived in Florida before. So I'm doing that thing where I'm like, well, actually, you know, like you're going to feel the air change before like the storm comes on. So like, you feel that you feel like that cool. It means like the storm's coming. I'm like, I hear myself. I know what I sound like, <laughs> but it is what's happening currently in my household. <laughs> <laughs> just fyi i mean <laughs> pertinent information <laughs> so kristen you've got your book is coming out in june yes morgan when is your book coming out what book no book. <laughs> don't you have a don't you have a i'm not done with it <laughs> oh, i thought you had a reissue of, of a book oh yeah right? that book i forgot about it <laughs> <laughs> Doing great. Everything's wonderful. Uh, July. July. Exciting. It's a free issue in my, you know, come on, people. <laughs> I didn't just write it. So it's not a new book, new to many people, however. And um, yeah, July. But it's a reissue it's a re of my first book. And a rebirth of your book. It's, it's kind of embarrassing, but like in a way that's like, Whatever, my OKCupid account got deleted. <laughs> like, I mean, all, I can just be embarrassed. Like, that's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, so the voice of Morgan Parker, 21, uh, will soon be out again. Who's, who's, redo, who's, who's reissuing it? Finhouse. Oh. You know, our publisher. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I saw that there's some things in the chat. Um, I mean, the, the question and answers. Um, the first question is um, leaning into the theme as a fellow Sag. How do you feel like being a Sagittarius affects your writing or writing process? Oh, shit. Alyssa, what do you think? I don't, I don't know. I, I feel like I am still trying to figure out, you know, even though I've been very deeply into astrology, I still don't exactly know what a Sagittarius is like. Um, you know, I know everything about my, you know, Capricorn stellium and I know where my, you know, my nodal placement and all of this. Uh, I don't, I, I think the Sagittarius thing is elusive for me. I, I feel like um probably the kind of like rapid movements of my interest from one topic to another feels like pretty sad to me um and that's reflected in the book in the ways you know I move through different you know like a million different topics um I just like put the encyclopedia of my mind on the page that feels like a kind of Sagittarian thing possibly I think That's so the the philosophical nature like the fact that you just said like I don't I still don't know like that is the most sad thing like, <laughs> you know like we're gonna be looking yeah. for the answers of the universe you know until the end of time we're just curious people and I think that is in all of our writing we're curious people who Mm, I was going to say we like people, but we don't. We're interested in, <laughs> <laughs> in like personhood. You know what I mean? That's a bit, doesn't that's... always translate to like individuals, but like wholeness <laughs> is interesting to us. And we are like, what's this world all about and why? And I think that that is like a very sad thing, like that kind of sociocultural curiosity I suppose and I would see that in all of our yeah in all of our work that's true and isn't the galactic center in the sign of Sagittarius and we are like the center of the universe I love that <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was Leo's <laughs> they would love to think that they would love to think that I'm willing to give it to them it's okay it's fine. Yeah. I think a lot of the time too, where people that, I mean, I, I, I think I do this also. I'll be like, we're, and then I'm like, I can only speak for me. Here's my own personal experience. I get like super interested in things too, but also get quickly bored. Mm -hmm. of things. Um, I'm like, yeah. I'm so invested in something and I'll like, right. Like I'll spend like three days in a row being in like a Wikipedia about like a certain television show I never watched and I'll like, <laughs> a Google episode for it. And that feels like the most important thing to me. And then when that is over, that is done for me. And I, it is completed and that is over. Uh, so sometimes like with my like creative process, which is a shit show, I feel like it's me constantly trying to like put some kind of parameters on it for myself. I'm like, mm. here we are, we're gonna put on some kind of process together. We're gonna like, we're gonna be like a morning writing person and we're gonna get up and we're gonna do some shit and like no bitch that's not what's happening <laughs> you're not working this is so boring to you right now like this is not fun and then like the times when I don't have time and like I feel like my brain's like very contrarian and it doesn't want to like like when I don't have time to work or I should be doing something else that's the time when it wants to be mm -hmm. and so maybe that's the time it feels like the most mm -hmm. serious to me where I'm like oh I'm supposed to be doing some stupid thing I said it it's not stupid somebody asked me to do something and I'm being paid for it and I should <laughs> do it um, but then I'm like, oh no, I don't want to do this like other thing finally that I didn't want to work on before. Now I'm ready to work on it. So maybe that's when it feels like that, like process wise for me, because it just feels like I'm in a constant conflict with my own brain about working on any kind of thing, because it's, I feel like it's actively working against me sometimes. I feel that a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I just texted you the other day, Tommy, like I really did it to myself this time. <laughs> Because it is like a thing where we have so many, we want to like move from thing to thing and like the world doesn't necessarily want to help us do that and be healthy. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it yeah. does become like, I know for me, 
I have been guilty of starting a new project because I'm so behind on something else. Ooh. Um, and so I'm like, well, if I just like get real wrapped up in this thing, maybe it will kickstart me. And you know, like sometimes that is how it happens. Like I have to like purposefully not do the thing I'm supposed to do in order to like not psych myself out. So it's like, I, I don't, I don't know, but uh, it's weird. I, it's, I guess it's weird that I have the impulse to like add another thing uh, in the face of like, there's too much. And I, I actually feel like I can't work, but you know, it's all about like recreating that excitement, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that's true. That's true. It's like that, that kind of, uh, frustrating energy is like the only thing that can get me writing sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's the only thing that can get me on a new project. I think, you know, when I'm just like desperately busy with my job, then I start, you know, compulsively like writing these paragraphs between meetings um you know and, and like having a hard time tear myself uh away from the desk um to go you know do something that I'm you know uh that my employer expects of me um yeah I think I've tried to harness some of that energy through form by just like letting the associations just happen and that was like a big thing that I had to let go of at one point in the writing process. Um, it, was, it was summer, it was, maybe that was when you were here, Kristen. Um, I was just like at a point in the process where I had all these library books out on like witchcraft and stuff. And I was like, God, this is so boring. Like, I don't care about the history of witches. Like I'm, you know, I've got enough witch stuff in my book. Let me like write about uh, like, video games or whatever um let me write about my ex-boyfriend again I, I just wanted to follow what was interesting to me mm -hmm. and I think you know for the longest time I was not making any progress on this book because I thought it needed to be like capital I important and basically not about my ex-boyfriend <laughs> uh, because I knew that that was not important and uh I was supposed to have been over him a long time ago and I wasn't and so I was like let me just let me just go with this because I do need to write a book at some point to get tenure. <laughs> <laughs> so let me like try to get tenure with a book about my ex-boyfriend. It works for every Jonathan in the world. So you're <laughs> <fine>. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure how uh, uh, being a Sagittarius kind of applies to my writing now because I'm kind of discovering a new type a new genre, like a new world. And I haven't written for myself in a very, very, very long time. The stuff that I've been doing in the past year has been writing for other people, writing for showrunners, writing for people, for bosses, for their projects. My job is to ferry other people's projects into the world. And I find that deeply unsatisfying. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't, I mean, but, I, but it's a job, right? Then I, I have had a couple of times where I've worked on projects of my own and and it and it I think what I find is that I get I am extremely full and still deeply unsatisfied. Mm. That I keep I, I, oh. I and I get restless in writing. Um and and sometimes curious and I'm wondering if that curiosity isn't also rooted in some kind of fear of some it's weird, it's weird to feel to feel to to like be audacious enough to put something into writing and put that in front of other people and also deeply not want to be looked at. <laughs> uh, yes. And and to want to want to make a book and to want to make a thing and put it out in the world and say, read this, but yeah. but don't, but do, but don't, but do, but don't, but do, but don't. Because I care, but I don't care. But I because I care, but I don't care. I don't <laughs> care, but I care, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's my current struggle. <laughs> yeah. But we do, we keep doing it. You know what I mean? Like, and even when I feel like, oh, should I? And I don't know how I feel. It's kind of like, I already know I'm going to do this. Like, I'm just a glutton for whatever will come out of this. You know what I mean? Like, I can't resist the curiosity of putting my brain in front of other people and just being like, 
weird, right? Like, you know, like, it, like I'm curious about that. You know, like what happens when my brain enters the rest of the world and interacts with it? Like that is interesting and uh, weird. So yeah, we do it anyway. And I think that is a thing. Yeah. Being okay, not okay, but that like state of dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. I think about that a lot. Like I'm just, things are unsatisfying and there's, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's okay to feel like, and I'm not just talking about, you know, how I forgot my pussy's there, but like, I think it's okay to be like, there's some, there's, it's not enough. It's not enough. You know, like there's more and I want to access it, you know? But how unsatisfying would it be if, if at some point it wasn't like it's, if there was like an end point, if there was like an arrival, I think if that would also be there was an arrival. We would be unsatisfied with that. You know what I mean? Like, nah, -uh. there's something over there. I just feel like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, know, no matter like, what. She I feels mean, endless. It does. And, you know, I was thinking about how with my first book, when it came out, I was just so like, I felt like I had failed. It felt like, so, you know, I felt this dread and this disappointment, but like, mostly it was just this dread that I hadn't done something right because I didn't feel right about it. Um, I did talk to some friends who were like very successful and they were like, well, yeah, you didn't do everything right. You could have done more with your publicity in these specific ways. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's good to know. Now the book is out. So <laughs> Jesus. you know, whatever. That was, that was a hard time. Um, but, <laughs> but, you know, um, and I thought, you know, this time I've done, you know, everything differently. Like I've had so much support from Tin, Tin House, like just so much support from all my friends and, and I've been doing so much, but there is still this dread and I'm realizing it's not, like situational it's just that's my heart it's made of dread <laughs> it's just like <laughs> you know always feeling like and I don't know I don't know I don't know if that's I think that's probably my Capricorn stellium that's probably that's probably not so much of a sad thing but um is that yeah. you is that where we cross paths <laughs> oh yes that, that's right you have you have your moon in oh, Capricorn. I have, yeah Venus and Capricorn and that's okay yeah Capricorn and so I don't know what to do with it <laughs> Venus like is confounding to me <laughs> that whole arena yeah. is, just seems hard <laughs> <laughs> yes mm -hmm. I don't even try anymore I don't even look for it I'm not on the hunt I don't care I deeply don't care I don't want it I don't need it I'd get it away from me I'd kill it if I saw it <laughs> <laughs> Um, if anybody wants to like ask anything else in the Q and A, you can. Um, oh, Alyssa, I did want to ask you um, because you were like mentioning. I was remembering today because I was thinking about. Um, first, of all, I was very excited. I was just good to see. I like, get to see people I fucking like. <laughs> mm -hmm. just, like an evening, an evening of drinking and seeing people I like and putting on real people's clothes. Um, but I was like um, remembering when I came to see you in Columbus that time, just like in that impromptu trip that mm -hmm. I just like came and like stayed at the hotel and just visited you for like three days. And you were in the middle of writing this book and you were talking so much about, I don't know, a lot of, I mean, we talked a lot about different writing things because I was in the middle of doing like edits for Mostly Dead Things for Tin House. And- Yes, you, I helped. Yeah, you did. <laughs> you gave me a lot of like sex toy advice. <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. She's like, put in jelly pack rings. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. Um, but you were talking so much. I remember you took me to like, first we went to like, there was like so much talk about like twinning and doubling and doppelgangers. Like even when I was there visiting you, cause that was something you were writing about in there but that was just something we were thinking about and talking about a lot. And we went to like, I remember we went to that bookstore that that maze like kind of bookstore that like is there. The book loft. Yeah. I'm going tomorrow, yeah. Which was so cool. You took me over to like the kind of like 
self-helpy kind of like interesting like section and we did that and then we took a picture like outside and we were both like where we look like each other in this picture and then we went to this bar like the day I was leaving or the day before I was leaving and you told me the story about meeting your like doppelganger yourself like your other self and I wondered if you could talk about like just because I'm so fucking fascinated by it like just in general but I really love hearing you talk about like doppelgangers and that like kind of doubling of the self and if you would just indulge me and talk about like the significance of that in this book because I really just fucking loved it yeah I you know so for um people in the audience who haven't read it's so I think it was like 2012 or something like that. Um, the dates in the book, you, you can find it. I was on the bus in Seattle, riding the bus home from work. I was so hungover. I was drinking so much at that time. And like, was just like really, you know, really sick from, from alcoholism. And I was so hungover and was sitting on the bus and this woman was getting off the bus and she was definitely me from the future. Like, a real person this was not a hallucination this is not like a metaphor this was like a person getting off the bus she had glasses like mine I'm not wearing them but the glasses like I usually wear and um she had like you know the same widow's peak that I have and um and she looked like me she was me and she was wearing this like surgical mask and this wool cape and she like stopped and looked really startled to see me like really shocked. And then she just wordlessly got off the bus really close to my house, um, my, my apartment at the time. And, you know, I didn't know what to make of it. So I put, I put out a Craigslist ad, like a missed connections or whatever. <laughs> and so like you were me from the future. Uh, like, are you out there? Um, I heard from a couple of people who weren't her. They were, they just like wanted to give me support. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I hope you find yourself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and then I saw her again getting off the bus um, up the street, and she was older. And then I saw her again in the grocery store. And I just, you know, I never totally figured out what it meant. Um, I hear from people a lot that they've seen my doppelganger, like, you know, like it was definitely me. Um, I mean, I, I hear that from people quite a bit. And I just kind of got curious about what, um, you know, what, what happened there? Why did I see myself from the future? And I wrote about, I wrote about her in the essay White City that's in the book. Once I got to Columbus, I was in a neighborhood near this one. Um, I was at a bar and I was just checking out the neighborhood because I wanted to buy a house there. Um, and this woman um, came up to the bar and like put a notebook down, I think. And, um, and just like looked at me, I think she said hello. And she was definitely me from the future as well. Um, and then she left and went back to play pool and she was still there. You know, I could have said something, but I was like really flustered. Um, and she left that notebook there. And I thought like, either I am or am not supposed to open the notebook. So I, I didn't open it and I just left. I was just too like freaked out. Um, you know, I, oh, I think the thing maybe I haven't told you about Kristen is, Early in the pandemic, um, I was going to the grocery store. I got out of my car. I was wearing a wool cape and I got out of my car, you know, had my mask on and saw myself in the mirror, in the, um, in the car door, when the car window, car door window. And I was like, oh, that's the woman from the bus. And I got really scared that I was going to die. Uh, obviously I didn't, <laughs> but I was like, oh, maybe that was like, you know, um, apocalyptic or something, you know, telling me that I was like, this is how I'm going to look around the time of my death. Um, wasn't that. So I still don't know what that was all about, but I, you know, I, I asked friends and I, I thought about it for years. And I think that the, the explanation that makes the most sense to me 
Um, and I don't know how this makes any sense to me, but I, I like the idea that I have these selves that I've kind of sloughed off um, at different turning points because I've had so many significant transformative turning points. And, you know, this book is about the turning point of getting sober and, um, you know, just like feeling a lot of the feelings that I had not up to that point dealt with. Um, and, you know, I, and I think that there's, there's lots of other turning points in the book, you know, in my life, um, different directions I could have taken. Um, I don't know whether those possibilities are still out there in the form of different selves. Um, but, you know, I, I think the book is a lot about just documenting these weird things that happened to me, like things that are just really unexplainable, these synchronicities in my research, in, you know, my lived experience and research and like, you know, a video game I was playing or, or whatever, like things that I took in. Um, some of the synchronicities I'm sure were, you know, my own, my brain's concoction. Um, but some things that happened just, you know, like my ex-boyfriend who the book was about having the same name as a magician from Ohio when I was also writing about magicians, like that's pretty weird. Um, <laughs> you know, things like that. Um, I just wanted to, through this book, bring them in and get them on the page and and, you know, just lay them out and document them and not have to make a narrative question out of it. Um, just to kind of like bring them together and not put pressure on myself to control the outcome of how those were going to be on the page. Mm. Um, and that's definitely true of the, you know, the, the doppelgangers too, um, that I still don't know. I still don't know why. And I, I don't, and I think, you know, to resolve the plot, like the emotional plot of the book, I didn't need to figure out everything or anything at all. I just needed to exit. Um, and that's really what the, the, the book, I think the way it ends is not about finding the answers that I was, you know, looking for along the way. It's just, um, just exiting these like really self-destructive time loops and relationship patterns. And, um, and I think that that was due to, in part to like a basic belief that there was something going on in the universe, which I did not believe for a really long time. Do you feel that like the, that the freedom from, of, from expectation to make meaning is kind of how meaning gets made? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I, because I was trying so hard for so long to, you know, come to these insights and, you know, do the outlining and, um, and, you know, I wanted to know that I was going to have a book at the end and that it was going to be, um, you know, a memoir that was like very recognizable as having a plot arc and was like super easy. Um, never mind that I didn't have any experience that would fit a plot arc that was super easy. Like there's nothing that happened in my life that like made any kind of narrative sense um, in that regard. Um, yeah, and so once I like stopped putting pressure on myself to come to all these realizations and just put the stuff together. I mean, like we were talking about earlier, that's when like, my curiosity was sparked. That's mm -hmm. when um, I was actually excited about things and was thinking about them and like wanted to tell people. Um, but it's like kind of hard to explain to people a lot of the time, like, um, you know, like here's this weird connection in my research. Um, all of, I found that in all of the works I am examining, people have fallen off cliffs. Like, okay, <laughs> but you know, I could tell the reader that. I could put that on the page and make right. it interesting. I feel like when you don't, when, when, uh, once again, when you freed yourself from the expectation to make meaning, there's something, I think anyway, there's something instinctual that arises, or there's something that you can yeah, convene yeah. with your instinct better and just mm -hmm. kind of like trust yourself that it'll, that you'll put it together. I mean, this is your job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> but isn't that poems? You know what I mean? Like I, mm-hmm. it, when I, uh, as I'm working on nonfiction, I find it, I'm like caught in that, like, okay, let me make these connections because in my mind, they're there, you know? Yeah. Um, because in my mind, it's just like laying it all out and internally there is some sense to it all, but having to like put it in a sentence versus put two lines next to each other and like let it arise out of there, you know, is a really different process. But I think that is what, at least for us, draws us to that type of poetry is that it is, it's instinctual. And and the when you're writing poems, you don't have to feel like you have to explain or answer or anything like that. Like that, you know, that pressure isn't there to begin with, or at least that's how it is for me versus writing prose, you know, and it's hard, but that's like a really important step. I think it's really inspiring to hear you talk about it because I do feel like that is a hard thing to get to when the way that we think of traditional memoir is the way that we think of traditional memoir, even though we know that the way that we experience life is nothing like that. Yeah. It's just like weird and random, you know, and like kind of interesting and like a bummer. And you know, that's just how it is. It seems like like it like it's expecting us to do problem solving in this kind yeah. of way, which is like not reasonable. Um, and I think what we've all kind of talked about this way where like none of us really like I liked it I was like haha I don't know what I'm doing but like no really fucking I don't know what the fuck I'm doing like a lot of the time so thinking in terms of like work I don't want to know what the fuck I'm doing <laughs> I don't want to know because I feel like if I do feel like I know what I'm doing then I then I really don't know what I'm doing yeah like, this idea of like looking at prose in this kind of way and expecting that I'm going to be able to make connections or kind of put something together that like I'm going to have like x plus y equals yeah. is not reasonable or you can't control that no it doesn't seem like rational to be able to be like you know like because I'm the engineer here I'm like the engineer is like completely lost control of the train <laughs> the tracks we don't know what's happening here so it's like that like makes like a lot of sense to me actually the most sense is like no sense maybe yeah I wonder what I I would love to talk to someone who is a big outliner and like really thrives on knowing what the whole thing is going to be because I know that I used to know people like that in Seattle but I I don't know I left that place (laughs) I always tell my students, like, if you know what you're going to write, put down your pencil. Like, what Mm -hmm. are you up to? If you're like, I have a plan for this poem, then go away. Like, the poem (laughs) is for you. You know, like, you have to, Mm -hmm. the earlier you realize that, the better, you know, because otherwise you're just fighting with this other force where the, you know, the engineer has lost control. (laughs) You know, it just isn't. And it comes out that way, you know, it comes out flat because the writer isn't excited about anything as the book is being written, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, and I see that too. I think, you know, I definitely have to, um, when I'm introducing writers to nonfiction in my classes, um, when they're, you know, taking the classes for the first time, that is something we need to establish. And I know that like, I'm not anxious about that anymore because I have written enough at this point to know, like to, to be able to trust my process. But before I wrote, before I had like, I mean, you know, like as recent as maybe 2016, 2015, before I really got rolling on white magic, I did not trust that I could finish anything. Mm -hmm. And So it was that anxiety that was driving me, like coming to something and thinking like, am I actually ever going to write again? Mm -hmm. Because there was a time when I thought I wasn't going to write again. And like 20, I think 2016, I just thought, you know, maybe I'm done or 2015. I just, you know, I hadn't, I didn't write very much after I got sober um, for a while. I didn't write for six months, I think. Um, And then you know, after that, just not very often. Um, 
and yeah and I think that there was like that anxiety like that that um you know distrust of myself and of my abilities um and finally like it was just like I, I finally broke through something and it's it's so much better and it makes writing so much more fun um which is what it's supposed to be like I keep saying I would have gotten I would have gotten an MBA I I well I wouldn't have but I should have gotten an MBA if I weren't going to be a writer I in college the English the English building was right next to the business school and you could tell the difference <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying like I I have to find something pleasurable yeah. in this and not just anxiety making and yeah. dread, like dread uh because you know I I could be one of those people on the um you know, like on, on the the business channel where the, there's all those people that are like in the, the business stock exchange. Channel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all those people oh in the God. stock exchange. I swear to God, every time I'm talking to somebody about the book, I bring it back to the stock exchange. I'm sorry, but channel yeah. is literally what I'm going to call it from now on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, Alyssa. <laughs> I love it so much. There's still hope for me. There's still time. I can still realize my dream of becoming a stockbroker. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what they do, but I'm learning. They Apparently they move around fake money. They do, yeah. Like, I'm, and people say like, my job is weird. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what the fuck? Oh, it's We're wild. I'm not doing I, anything crazy. <laughs> no, it's, I've been learning about the stock market and it is the wildest thing. You know how I know you've been doing that? Cause I saw your tweets and I was like, Alyssa is spiraling. <laughs> she has got into the stock market. You don't even know. I can't, I can't, I can't get into it. There's too much. I, I cannot get into it, but yes, I am deeply interested in the stock market. I, in the business channel as the pros call the business yeah. channel. <laughs> from the, in the business channel I don't know what a stockbroker does but I know there is something going on Something's in happening. the stock market <laughs> it's cocaine that's what's going that's true. on <laughs> that's what's for dinner I'm like <laughs> oh my god <laughs> CNBC CN business channel <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Cocaine news business channel. <laughs> That's beautiful. I failed to see the lie anywhere. That's, <laughs> that checks out for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I miss you guys. I, know. I miss you too. I you know, come over. Just in person. Mm, be nice. Really, really miss miss people in the world you know I like hearing you talk about Morgan like you saying like oh I went out to this bar like I don't necessarily I, I kind of miss like listening to people be like shitty weirdos at a bar just for like fiction purposes right yeah. <laughs> that is true I'm I miss eavesdropping so badly very badly but like truly the thing I miss the most is just being able to like just like hang out and drink with friends and just be, yeah like, you know talk about you know one of us wanting to like get into business <laughs> eventually my next career oh my god oh my god um Kristen the other day uh well Monday as you, you know Alyssa that there was a new moon or a full moon and <laughs> Rachel texted me and was like I'm at a residency making everyone burn shit for the full moon yeah <laughs> So now that like that is now traveling, literary circles are <laughs> everywhere, are burning things. So. I love that for us, for all of us. I've definitely done that since then and made other people do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what were I wonder what we were supposed to be doing? Cause it was like the literary festival time, but we were up to the feelings and burning. we were up to nonsense. I think. Yeah. <laughs> We're up to nonsense at that Texas Book Festival. 
I mean, remember book festival? Let's we'll just force everyone to do a ceremony. <laughs> like, <laughs> so remember that was? I think that was like the night before you got the guy did the pedicab for us. Oh yeah. <laughs> We came out of the we came out of a party and it was like there was a guy in a pedicab and he was like pedicab and Morgan's like, well, are you willing to go all the way to this like house that we're staying at? And the guy was like, hell yeah, I can do it. And she's like, get in, we're going in the pedicab. That guy was sorry. It was like uphill. And the guy like paused a couple times to like take a breather. I was smoking in the back the whole time. I was just like, oh. <laughs> that was one of those. It was forty minute pedicab. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Weird suburb, and he was like, oh. yeah. And then he got to go all the way back. <laughs> I know. At least it was downhill from there. I guess. <laughs> I was like, here you go, buddy. Here's a here's a tip. You see you later. That was an incredible. And then we went inside and like Rachel and like, they were like, oh yeah. They didn't know what they were doing in there. They didn't, <laughs> yeah, no. Weird house. I, this is the thing we're meant with. Like, I can't wait. We're all going to go in a house together and just. Yeah, that was the thing. Sitting at a weird round table and burning things all together. <laughs> you know, <laughs> these are the things we missed. I do miss it. I do miss it. Well, we'll be, we'll be back at book festival soon and we'll like write more books and have them come out and we'll do this in person sometime. I'm never writing another book again. They you pay me way too much that. to not, they pay me way too much to not write books no more. I'm sorry. But you keep <laughs> saying that and I just have to, you know, call out that I do not believe. Oh, but you know, I'll be doing, I'll be doing the collected in a couple of years. So we'll, we'll, we'll tour on that. The collected. <laughs> yeah. This nigga is not over the hill at all. Like, you're just. <laughs> in my forties, in my 40th year, I'll do the collected. Cause you're a younger poet until you're 40 and then you're not a younger poet anymore. What are you then? Just Crone. <laughs> <laughs> That's so lesbian. Old head. I know, I don't know. <laughs> All right, you guys. I got to I got to eat some chicken tenders. <laughs> it's very late here. I'm going to eat some chicken tenders and call good. this a mess. Um but it's been so good talking to you all and um thank thank you everyone who is here and um thank you for the messages in the chat and the questions and um yeah. Is there anything else we do to wrap this up? I don't know. <laughs> I feel like we're doing great. <laughs> You're all good. That was great. <laughs> thank you so much for hosting us. This has been so yeah, much fun. Thank you all. It was fun. It felt it was like a pleasure like having a really nice time with my friends. <laughs> yes. We appreciate it as ever. Literary arts. Thank you. Everyone yes. go eat dinner or go to bed i don't know <laughs> i don't know what time it is uh, congratulations <laughs> yes Yay. amazing 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 book yes beautiful. thank you <laughs> bye y'all good night, bye. Good night.